Welcome to December's public broadcast. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us tonight. Just, under, just, just heard that I understand the Prime Minister is uh, doing a press conference, a Q&A &Q exactly at the same time as us. So um, hopefully that won't be eating into uh, uh, the number of people watching us. Uh, uh, I'm Richard, I'm the Chief Exec here at Sherwood. To the right we have... Good evening, I'm Dave, I'm the Medical Director. And then... Hi, I'm Julie, Chief Nurse. I'm Simon, I'm the Chief Operating Officer. Thank you. And then also joining us, but not in the room. Oh, hi, this is Kinsey Clark from Health Watch Nottingham and Nottinghamshire. I'm the Partnerships Manager. And Thanks, standing Kinsey. on for Health the CA. Thank, thank you for joining us. Um, and also we've got, uh, we've got Robin with us. I've got Robin, hi, Head of Communications. Head of Comms at Sherwood. So uh, a huge amount going on in the hospital uh, and outside of the hospital. We wanted to take the opportunities we've done for the last four or so months to give you a bit of an update uh, around how the hospitals are doing, what it may mean for you. Uh, there's obviously an update around the COVID vaccination, uh, which is going well. We can give you some of the numbers around that, an update around visiting. Uh, an update if we need it about uh, what the tier restrictions mean for this Christmas and the personal responsibility about reducing the transmission rate uh, and then we'll give you an update about the sort of the wider restoration uh, uh, of, of all of our services. Um, we'll start off with a thank you and I'm sure we'll, we'll finish with a thank you. Thank you so much uh, for all of your support for the hospital over the last couple of months. Uh, inevitably given the time of year we've been reflecting on 2020 which has clearly been a challenging year um, but I think in the health world we also feel um, pretty proud about what the team at Sherwood has delivered uh, and I think in general um, we've been able to provide uh, safe care uh, to patients whether it's at Newark Hospital, Kings Mill or Mansfield Community Hospital. Um, really keen to hear from you in terms of any questions that you may have. Again, the caveat that we've previously said, we can't go into the, uh, the specifics of anyone's individual care, but we can certainly try and uh, provide answers to everything uh, wherever possible. So um, today, uh, Monday the 21st of December, we have 78 patients with COVID in the organisation uh, and seven in intensive care. The number's sort of fluctuating. Um, it's, that's certainly lower than it was uh, around Easter time and lower than it was a couple of weeks ago, but it's um, uh, it's increasing and, and decreasing um, uh, sort of by 10 or so patients for sort of from a day to day basis. Um, I think like the wider NHS, what we're forecasting is um, uh, after Christmas and New Year, we would expect to see quite an increase possibly in COVID patients coming to the organisation. Uh, and Simon, our Chief Operating Officer, um, uh, can give us an update about how we're planning to um, uh, to, to care for those patients uh, in a planned way. Anything we want to say in terms of um, the numbers of patients in the hospital at the moment? Yeah, so the hospital's pretty full. We're at about 90% occupancy. Uh, it's about 538 patients in our hospitals um, at, at the moment. So we're pretty busy uh, in the in the run up to Christmas. Um, as we've said, absolutely so proud though of, of, of the commitment from everyone in, in, in the organisation. So thank you to all the colleagues who are involved uh, directly or indirectly in, in, in patient care. Uh, something we touched on last month probably worth drawing attention to the emergency department at Kings Mill and also the urgent care centre at Newark. Uh, we're really fortunate, uh, we believe, that um, uh, despite <coughs> what our sort of normal winter pressures and as Simon was describing uh, an organisation that's pretty busy uh, across our two emergency sites being able to provide uh, timely care to the vast majority of patients uh, on the emergency care pathway so thank you to everyone uh, involved in that we've certainly got two emergency care departments that we should be uh, very proud of. Moving on to the Covid vaccine, uh, Julie are you going to start us on that? Sure, um... So we've been providing the COVID vaccine um, in the hospital now for almost two weeks. We've vaccinated over 3,000 people. We are prioritising um, three groups of people that have been set nationally. So the over 80s, um, people who work in care homes or social care, and then healthcare workers. Um, we're beginning to contact patients who are over 80. Um, and in the coming days, people will be able to book on themselves and there'll be some communications coming out about that later this week. But I think it's fair to say um, that we're doing pretty well and we're pleased with progress. 
Yeah, we're pleased. So we're vaccinating out of, of Kings Mill, as Julie said. Um, uh, so so this is, I think, day 13, day 14, day 14 of it. Um, so we've gone from relatively low numbers to quite high numbers. We are prioritising. The process to this point has been, we have been contacting the people uh, proactively. Now, as Julie described, we're going to switch it over the next day or so. Uh, and we're going to um, offer people who, who meet those characteristics, in particularly the age characteristics, the opportunity um, uh, to come to Kings Mill initially uh, to have their vaccine. Anything you want to say about that, Dave? The only I would thing I'd say is people need to have an appointment. We won't take walking. Yeah. So don't don't just turn up. Don't make... turn up. You must have an appointment. Yeah. Um, and I would just strongly encourage everyone who who uh, meets those criteria to have the vaccine. Um, I think I can ask you this. You're uh, a clinical worker, Dave, you've been caring or involved in the care of clinically vulnerable patients. Have you had the vaccine? I've had the vaccine, yes. Do you have any side effects from it? Uh, I had a sore arm for about two days or so, um, and that was that was the only side effects I had. Uh, so uh, I had mine within the first week or so because I was doing a shift on the, on the intensive care. Um, and uh, so I'm due for the second vaccine um, early January. So we're doing it 28 days, aren't we? Four weeks afterwards. Yeah. Do people have to have the flu vaccine to have the COVID vaccine? No, you don't have to. You do need to have a gap between two or four weeks, isn't it? Yeah. Seven days. Seven days. Seven days. Seven days. Seven days. But we would we would still be uh, recommending people to have the flu vaccine. On that point, Sherwood, 86% of colleagues at Sherwood had the flu vaccine, which is incredibly high. Thank you everyone we've had it obviously through in particular the primary care networks the gps out in the community got a really high uh, flu vaccine uh, uptake across the community and we would continue to urge people it's a great way of uh, protecting yourself and others this winter um, it will take time to get everybody vaccinated uh, but we are making great progress we're working effectively with partners uh, and we would hope as we move into too early uh, in the new year We'll be opening up other sites and then we can really motor uh, on that vaccination rent but just uh, in case it hasn't been clear uh, it is personal choice uh, whether people have the, the vaccine or not although we i think we're now in a position where we'd be uh, uh, supporting people's choice to have it anything you want to any questions coming through robin we've got questions coming through we've got one about the vaccines so perhaps we'll ask yeah. about that now um i think we've asked the first part so anonymously how is the vaccine process going at sherwood and then the second part is what do people do if they would like to get a vaccination? Just, just go, let's just cover both of them again. I think we have done, but how, Julie, your assessment, how's the vaccine process going? I think it's going really well, really, really well. We've, um, as we said, we've done over 3,000 vaccinations in our first 13 days, so that's really good progress. Um, in terms of getting the vaccination, if you are a patient over 80, um, we are reaching out to patients by telephone and writing to patients. In the coming days, we will be releasing a link um, where patients or a member of your family or friends can support you to book your own appointment, but we will continue to telephone and write to patients. If you're a care worker, um, our colleagues um, out in the CCG are supporting care home managers to get staff booked onto the programme. So, I would suggest you speak with your um, care home manager so that you can get booked on the same would apply for social care. If you're an NHS worker, um, either at Sherwood or another NHS organisation um, within our within the area, there will be a link for you to book on as well. So those links will be released over the next 24 hours or so. Yes, if I was um, 55 year old member of the public. Can I get my vaccine? Not at Sherwood yet. Not at Sherwood yet. There's the other sites um, open um, get through those three priority groups. The criteria will change. Thank you. But we need to be clear that the aspiration is that with time as we get more vaccine and as we get through the first cohorts, then we'll be vaccinating everyone who wants the vaccine. Yeah. We've been asked it around the um, second strain as well. Um, are we confident that the vaccine is um, is, is effective against the second strain? 
Got to be on that day. Uh, so, so to be honest with you, I don't have much more information than you you will have heard on the TV about that. So, as far as we can tell, uh, this is a, 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 a the, the 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 variant that's been detected. There are lots of different variants, but this particular one seems to have an increased uh, ability to be passed from person to person or transmitted. We don't have any information yet about the vaccine. We anticipate that the vaccine will be entirely uh, uh, um, active against against that in the same way. And Mark, just so just again from my understanding, from what I've been reading, Dave, is that as that you described with the with this new strain, the belief is that it is easier to transmit, but um, it's it's in terms of the impact and also the death rate, there's no difference to the pre-existing strain. Not as far as we know at the moment. There is some suggestion that it might be uh, more transmissible amongst the younger population. Um, so that's some some data that, that's just starting to appear. But apart from that, we're like everyone else, we're waiting for more information. Okay. Anything you'd like to say about the vaccine, Kinsey? Um, I was just actually only going to mention that from some of our community contacts, I think there's a bit of misinformation about the vaccine. So, yeah, I think it's just fantastic that we are encouraging all of us staff for people who are eligible to take the vaccine and also anyone else who is offered when they are offered to take the vaccine. <laughs> but yeah, there's, there's a bit of a, a sort of a, some information going around in some of the communities that um, that we, we're kind of trying to encourage people to to take the general sort of the, the formal advice around the vaccine. Cool, thank you. Other questions, Robin? Uh, we've got other questions in, in other areas. Should we to just go into those? Or? Um, well, uh, anything anything else from a from a COVID vaccine perspective, Sam? No, no vaccine perspective. Okay. Should we move on to another hot topic? Uh, Christmas visiting. Julie. Thank you. Um, so we're making some changes to visiting uh, maternity. I'll start with maternity. So um, we have, we're now welcoming partners into all antenatal appointments as per the national guidance. And as per previously, birthing partners are welcome um, on the labour order postnatally. So that's maternity. For paediatrics, we're going to allow both parents to visit on Christmas Day and Boxing Day. So this is a change from our normal visiting of one parent. And then for all adult infants, so this is ward areas, not um, the assessment unit areas, but those patients that have been admitted to a ward, they will be able to have two visitors for a two hour period. The ward leader will organise the visiting slots throughout the day because we need to ensure that we can maintain social distancing. So it's really important that you attend during your allocated slot and that only two of you arrive. And that's for Christmas Day and Boxing Day. Visiting restrictions remain in place in the emergency department and on our, our um, EAU as well, just because it's really difficult to socially distance in those areas. Thank you. We touched before about the balance between um, safety and compassion. Do you think we're still able to maintain that balance with those changes? I do. Yeah. I mean, we'll need to work together to keep everybody safe, but I think if we follow the rules, it'll be absolutely fine. Thank you. Any questions on visiting? Yeah, we had a specific question about Christmas, but we have, we have covered that. We also had a message in advance, um, so if you're first watching, um, they are asking about uh, end of life visiting. Um, please could you tell me what the policies are around visiting a family member who is on end of life care? Um, and there's been some individual circumstances about, about this person that I won't go into the details of. Um, they understand that there are restrictions due to coronavirus rules, but um, what exceptions could be made under certain circumstances? Yeah, so we do have a compassionate visiting policy in place for patients who are end of life. Um, and that would be that we allow up to two people to visit. And the ward, ward leaders should help to organise this with you. I would encourage the family that have contacted us to let us have their details and we'll get in touch with them. So if, if they're not watching, um, we've got their email, so we'll, we'll respond to them directly as well as we hope they can call it now. Um, and that's everything for the moment around visiting. What would be uh, the next obvious topic to go to? 
In terms of sort of questions, I think we've had at the moment is, is a question related to uh, foreign borders and I guess into, into Brexit preparedness. Okay. Um, will the closure of foreign borders to and from the UK cause the hospital any problems with supplies over the next few weeks? The easy, easy answer, and I'm not trying to make light of it, is we don't know. Um, obviously, that's probably incredibly unhelpful. Chief Exec says he doesn't know what's going to happen. That's not why I'm saying. Uh, although it probably is because I've just said that. Um, my understanding is that uh, the government, first of all, are working very hard uh, with the French government and others to reopen those borders. Clearly, as an organisation, we have been planning for a no deal EU exit appropriately and working with partner organisations and myself and other leaders. We're involved in uh, weekly meetings now for uh, a huge length of time for the planning. Um, my view is that uh, at Sherwood um, we have taken the planning um, uh, very seriously and everything within our control we are effectively controlling. Inevitably, we have to be honest about this, I don't think this is the scenario, but if the scenario was there was no uh, no movement of any form of goods into this country for the next three weeks, not only Sherwood, but the whole country would grind to a halt. I don't think that's the position that we're in. Um, so I suppose what I'm saying is we're planning effectively. I would imagine you'll see some change to the border restrictions uh, 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 tomorrow, uh, and uh, we continue to work with partners uh, to plan for that EU exit on the 1st of January. Dave? Just, just build on that. So often this question relates to the vaccine and the vaccine supply, so the current Pfizer vaccines manufactured in the EU, uh, and uh, we're assured that the, um, that the supply lines of the vaccine are protected, uh, and uh, they'll be flying it in as, as required or if necessary. Uh, that leads us on to drugs uh, and, and medicines, and again, we have uh, 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 some degree of stock holding that we've been uh, uh, nationally um, accumulating in here for our essential medicine. So again, as Richard says, we'd uh, anticipate minimal impact on that. And then finally, my understanding of the, the voted borders relates only to human handled goods. So if they've been palleted on, palleted off, they, they should be able to travel. I suppose I'm, I'm now trying to provide more assurance than I did bank, uh, building on what Dave said. We have a whole series of um, incredibly uh, uh, good um, subject matter experts in the organisation who are meticulously looking through those subject lines that Dave was describing. So um, some of the procurement issues, the meds, the pharmacy issues and things, and, and we feel assured that um, um, uh, we're in a good position going into this. Thank you. Um, no specific questions, but I wonder if it sort of makes sense to move into winter and Recovery off the back of back of. Do you want to touch on that? Yeah, on on that. So we've we've, um, we've recovered most of our services after the uh, after the spring pause um, in in some of those uh, non-emergency services. Um, so our outpatients um, is operating at about eighty five percent of what it was previously, um, and that is largely due to infection control reasons. Um, i.e. the number of patients you can have in a waiting area and those sort of things but we're compensating with that with hopefully some of you have used telephone appointments and virtual uh, clinic appointments so they're being used to try and reduce some of the footfall within the hospital and make sure our clinicians are able to to see patients in our patients our theatres have been doing uh, around 100 percent of their, their previous workload uh, that obviously goes up and down on a, on a, weekly, uh, on a weekly basis. So I think we're, we're doing quite a bit of operating. Some of that is affected by our critical care unit uh, go, going into its surge plan, um, but largely we've been keeping keeping operating going. Um, in terms of a waiting list, so patients um, are, are waiting a little longer, um, but they're being clinically prioritised. Uh, by clinicians on the waiting list, so trying to bring patients in who are, who are of the highest clinical priority. Our actual cancer um, waiting lists are broadly back to pre-COVID pre levels, which has been a huge piece of work by our colleagues within the organisation. Thank you to them for all the work that they um, have, have done around that. So we're starting to uh, 
reduce those waiting times for cancer care. Although there is work being done across the wider region to make sure that patients are taken in clinical priority order. Um, and that might mean that some patients have to be treated at other hospitals where it's important for them to, to, to get their treatment. So we recognise um, that some patients are waiting longer than, than we would like, um, but our activity is broadly getting back to normal levels uh, around. Can I ask you two questions? Uh, I'm clinically urgent or I'm in emergency. Am I going to get treated? Yes. Uh, and then uh, my second question, I often think about orthopaedics. So I'm waiting to have my knee done and I think I've been forgotten about. Um, so you won't be forgotten about and if you're on a waiting list, you will have had a letter um, from the organisation asking us to contact you, should you contact us, should you feel that your clinical priority has changed? Um, so please do that um, if, if, if you receive that letter. Um, and we continue to treat orthopaedic patients uh, and, and operate on them. And there's also uh, opportunities to be operated on in, in the independent sector as well if you're an orthopaedic patient. Thank you. One of the things we've touched on through this briefing before um, is on reflection, uh, it was so easy to switch our services off, whether it's Sherwood or the NHS in general, it's far more complicated as someone was describing, switch things back on again, uh, and maintaining uh, the safety both for patients but also for the people caring for them. As Simon referenced, I think the, um, the effort that's been put into this over the last five, six, seven months is incredible. The, uh, there are more people waiting for treatment now than there were this time last year. But that's not because we don't care, it's just because we're we're trying to play catch up with that period over sort of the beginning of the summer when things were shut down. But we would like to, to recognise that people are waiting longer than we would like, and we're sorry for that. But equally, thank you so much to the to the thousands of clinical and non-clinical colleagues that show have been involved in uh, reinstating these services. Thank you. Um, I just wondered, Kinsey, is there anything that you wanted to come in on off the back of that conversation from a health watch point of view? No, it was, was actually one of the areas I was going to ask you, but yeah, it's been very well covered. And I, I think sort of in light of the, the spread of the of the kind of disease again, and I'm not sure if some trusts are now kind of announced fair the cancellation is again, uh, the operation is they booked it and brought back and sort of before the second wave. And I, from what I'm hearing, it looks like you kind of not you haven't you haven't reached a stage where you're actually cancelling any 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 balan operation at the moment so we, we have cancelled a small number of operations kinsey to, to to manage our critical care surge but it's a very small number um, compared to a lot of other organizations and it's been done in line with clinical priority so but broadly we are um, Running our business as usual, despite managing uh, uh, the number of COVID patients that Richard mentioned earlier. Yeah, I, I was um, just so for, uh, for for consistency, just building what Simon said. I was asked on Friday nationally, uh, "Are we cancelling?" And, and the answer is no, as Simon described. Inevitably, though, uh, on rare occasions, we will have to um, uh, uh, cancel very uh, low numbers of patients, but not at the scale that's happening elsewhere. Uh, tiers, do we think it's likely that we'll be moving into tier four at any point? Um, I would welcome others views on this. The, my view is uh, we have no more information or insight than anybody else, including the person who's asked the question. Um, we could we could speculate and, and, and people may wish to, but, but, but who knows? All I would say, and I'm answering a different question, is um, the change in tiers, so areas have gone from a two to a three, and obviously places like London and some of the southeast have almost, well, they've gone from a two to a three to a four, is just a reinforcement if we needed it, that the rate of COVID in our community is incredibly high and likely to uh, to increase over the coming weeks. Well, so to some degree, some of that is within our own gift. It depends how we behave as a society, as a community over the next week, 10 days or so. Um, and uh, that comes back to the often quoted phrase that we all have individual responsibility to, to take with this as well as a collective ownership of it. How would you describe, um, uh, uh, Dave, choose a word to describe the Christmas that you're going to be experiencing? Quiet. <laughs> That's the word I was going to choose. 
and we're all gonna it's gonna be different this year isn't it but uh, but it is a personal responsibility yeah i don't know julie simon do you want to speculate on they're going to be have you heard there's going to be a tier five <laughs> wouldn't like to say I think I, I agree with Dave. It's, it's, it's largely around um, how our local communities respond to tier three restrictions. And if we continue to try and adhere to them, then we're less likely to go up the tier and more likely to drop the tier. And, uh, and, uh, and I think we've got to remember the, the, the impact of those small decisions and choices that, that may have on the hospital um, uh, over the short to medium term. But both in terms of emergency, care and a number of patients who need emergency care but also those patients waiting for elective care that I just described so I think we've all got a moral responsibility to try and adhere as best we can to those two tier three levels. So it's not a question here but I wonder if I can just say I don't know perhaps Dave can you reiterate what we think we would ask our community to be doing at this time particularly over Christmas? Hands, face, face. So, so, so the three key bits: are the hands, face, space, so the masks, the washing your hands, and the the, the two meter distancing. Uh, in terms of other aspects, so the 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 government has changed that, uh, as you'll be aware, of the weekend. So instead of there being uh, a five day, if you like, amnesty about uh, the the social mixing within the the support uh, within the bubbles, it's now come down to a single day on 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 Christmas Day, um, and and you know we we have the chance to think very very carefully about what that means to to us and to the people we're mixing with and in in reality mixing outside mixing in well ventilated rooms being uh, a very uh, careful about uh, uh, getting into people's uh, uh, personal space all of those aspects it's nothing new to what we've been trying to to enforce over the past five or six months really um other questions coming through, going back to a couple of topics we've touched on already. So if there's anything else you wanted to cover first, and then perhaps we'll come back to that if there is. Um, I think at some point, maybe not quite yet, but maybe some reflections on some some hope for 2021. Um, because this year has been a, a difficult year and and we recognise there's a change, as, as Dave and others have described, changes over the weekend with Christmas plans. Reality is, I certainly remember mentioning this a month ago, nobody is living their best life at the moment um i've speak, spoken to people in the last couple of days myself included who, who are beginning to struggle with some of this but i think there is there are reasons to feel the beginnings of some sort of hope and optimism that with things such as the the covid vaccine that we've described and some other things coming on board that there will emerge in 2021 a, a way out of this where we can begin to have some form of normality in our lives that's not to say that the next couple of months are going to be anything other than pretty difficult. Okay. Um, in that case, I'll, I'll ask the sort of two questions that have come through there. Um, there's one a bit of clarity around the sort of Christmas Day plans. Um, they're asking, so if you've got one patient in the hospital and they have two visitors as described, can they have two visitors in the morning and then two more different visitors in the afternoon? No. Uh, and the reason for that is that we need to enable everybody to have visitors, so we will stagger the slots, but each patient will get one two hour slot. One two hour slot with two visitors. With two designated visitors. And I think, you know, it comes back to recognising that people are unwell and all of those aspects. It comes back to what we were talking about, about the social bubbles and the, the visiting at Christmas. You've just got to think really carefully about the risk that you're placing yourself or placing the, you, the, your, your relative at during this and having multiple people to try and come and visit is not what we're encouraging. I think the one thing I should highlight as well is that some of our wards are COVID wards and so if they've got significant volumes of patients with COVID on they will be close to visiting and that's business as usual for us. On, the, on our uh, children's ward, you said uh, uh, two parents on Christmas Day and Boxing Day. Is that two parents or could it be one parent and one grandparent? It's two visitors, yeah. Two visitors, okay. Um, and the only other question come through at the moment is, is back to um, elective operations. Um, 
Last one for some speculation again, I think probably Simon. Do you think more operations will have to be cancelled in the new year? I think that's probably down in mind, sort of traditional winter pressures as well. Um, so we have a winter plan which is holding up at the moment. Um, uh, we are planning for something different in terms of COVID surges in, in, in the new year and those plans aren't completely formalised yet but we'll do that over the next week or so and I think then we'll have a clearer plan about what that the impact that has on elective care. Um, that, that said, um, our, our elective care is, um, is, is relatively small in terms of its bed usage, so we might find ourselves in a place where we can get a plan where we can carry on doing elective care and try and meet the emergency care demand. But clearly, if that emergency care demand becomes overwhelming at some point, um, we will have to make decisions about, about where patients are treated uh, in the best interests of all of those patients. Thank you. Uh, and that's, that's it for, for questions at the moment. Um, Kenzie, I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to ask from the Health Watchers point of view? No, really, I can't. I had, yeah, pretty much <laughs> I had a few notice and it's, it's all the areas that's been covered, including the cancellation and the, and the and the visitate, visiting and, and the vaccine. So no, I haven't really got anything further to ask. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, and the only thing we just had in is, is a message of thanks to well, all the NHS colleagues for everything they've done this year. So that's really nice. Thank you. Um, Thank you for that. But nothing else from the, from the chat. So should we, uh, let's conclude and um, try and finish with some optimism. Anything you want to say, Simon? Um, just to hope you can have as good a Christmas uh, as, as possible over this period and, and just taking heed of, 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 of what what the guidance is, but then trying at least to have a, a small celebration, if only at home. Thank you so That's what I'll be trying to do. <laughs> a small celebration at home. <laughs> the wild days that we, uh, we, yeah. we are experiencing. <laughs> um, uh, Julie, anything from you? No, I think it's the same as Simon, just to wish everybody um, a Merry Christmas and I hope that you do get some downtime during the holidays. Please follow the rules and help us to help you in the new year and thank you for everything that you're doing. You just um, sort of touched on it there, but a question if I may. So the, the, the majority of the clinical colleagues in this organisation are, are nurses and midwives. You're a midwife by background. Um, what can people watching this, whether they're or coming in to visit or, or patients? Is there anything else they should be doing or recognising to help our, our clinical colleagues above and beyond what we've said? No, I think the main thing is, is, is just to follow the rules and just to remember that they don't make the rules around visiting um, and that actually they've been made up to very careful consideration within the senior team. So they are enforcing a decision that's been made by others and I think you know, it's Christmas, so if you are in the hospital um, on Christmas Day, you know, enjoy it. The atmosphere will be nice. The teams will make it nice for your um, relatives, friends, etc. So try and enjoy the day the best you can. Just one other question. Uh, I feel silly uh, asking this, but should we remind people that they shouldn't be smoking in a hospital bed? We absolutely um, should. So um, thanks for raising this, actually. So, Oxygen is highly flammable and that's why we don't allow smoking anywhere within the hospital or outside of the hospital. We really need your support to enforce this. So if you are asked to bring um, smoking paraphernalia in for a patient, please don't do it. And equally, if you have a loved one that's in hospital, you know they've got this. Um, they've got smoking materials. Please take it home with you presents a real risk um, to patients and staff if people choose to smoke in hospitals. Thank you, very clear. Dave, words of wisdom, optimism? So optimism, so we touched on this on our staff brief, so, so I might just have uh, uh, an optimism about Sherwood and where we're going. So obviously this is a difficult period of time, we're going into the the, the Christmas period, we, we know that uh, often uh, the start of the winter period happens around that sort of time and we touched on the activity. In terms of what we've got coming coming on to show, we've got some uh, surgical developments on our Newark campus, we're going to build on those, going to try and increase surgical throughput on the Newark campus, I think that's really positive. We've got some building work 
that we need to uh, push on and complete on our Manso community campus. So I think that's that's really important. Um, and we've got a number of uh, exciting developments on this campus. We've got our gamma, gamma camera coming in. We've got a new MR, MRI scanner coming in. Uh, we've got some uh, other major big business cases coming in. So I think in terms of things to look forward to, positive things, there, there's a lot happening. Um, and I would just you know, reiterate, thank you so much for all of the, 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 the care and dedication you've given to our patients, for our staff and to our communities and to our patients. Thank you for working with us and I hope you have uh, the best holiday season that you can. Thank you. In a socially distanced way. Thank you. Robin? Um, uh, two things. There's a question that's come through, I'll ask after that. So, um, I guess I would I'd call myself an optimist by nature and that's been pretty tricky to maintain at points this year. Um, but I do have hope around the, the vaccination in particular, and I, I, believe, I genuinely believe that 2021 will be a better year than, than 2020. No, it's not. <laughs> but like a particularly high bar. <laughs> yeah, I think it will be. Um, but the last question, please, has come through from Ian. Um, um, and I'll, I'll read it out. Um, particularly given the emphasis on enhanced PPE and infection control regimes in the early phases of COVID. It is difficult to understand the increasing percentage of new infections that are being categorised as hospital acquired. With the advent of new, apparently more readily transmitted strain of the virus, this is causing some social media influencers to argue that hospitals are the most dangerous place to be. Is this trend unavoidable or is it a function of increasing fatigue among staff? Excellent question. Yeah, it's quite a long question, but I think the key bit here is bringing out around our asymptomatic testing, which I might yep. um, put, so put over your way. How you. kind. Thanks, Dave. Um, so we have home testing available to all our staff that want to do it. We're actively encouraging our staff to do it. We've rolled out over 4,000 kits um, in the last week, so staff are taking a test twice a week. Um, and this what we know is from our asymptomatic testing is that a very low proportion of staff actually have COVID and are asymptomatic. It's in the region of 1% or under. Um, but we have that in place and we will be continuing to test staff twice a week for the foreseeable future. Just to, forgive me, I'm not sure that answers Ian's question though, does it? Because I, I thought Ian was saying we're using way more PPE, etc. now, yet the rate of infection, hospital acquired infection is increasing. So, yeah, I think what he is, not putting words in his mouth, I think he's referring to the two different elements of the COVID. So, the first, the first frame when we had PPE and it was relatively safe. I think he's now saying that it looks like hospital acquired infections are more prevalent than community yeah. Yeah. infections. And, and is that is that because hospitals are a dangerous place? Is it because staff are tired and are not? I'm not sure, work? Julie, about whether that the, the point that hospitals uh, the hospital rate has gone up. Acquired infections are definitely not more prevalent than no. community acquired infections. Um, I think it's fair to say that um, certainly when the rates were increasing in Nottingham, we do see more hospital acquired infections, but we have a very low number at Sherwood, and that was pre before the introduction of asymptomatic testing for staff. I think it's fair to say since we've had the asymptomatic testing, we've seen what we call outbreaks really stabilise. Do you agree with that, Dave? Yeah, yeah, and uh, this is absolutely a key focus for us. So Julia or, or I chair uh, the the outbreak meetings uh, many times a week to keep an absolute focus on this. Just to just follow up, really, he's, he's clarified. He says he's referring to national trends. I think. Oh, okay. Is that true nationally? I think, I think it has been true nationally, but I think the asymptomatic testing is supporting um, a reduction in it. But I think it's fair to say hospital acquired infections have been seen to be increasing, but they are they remain significantly lower than yeah, I think the, the rate of transfer outside of hospitals are much higher than it is in hospitals. Very good, thoughtful question though, Ian. Thank you for, for, for raising that. Um, one of the one of the positives I think about one of my positive one of the things I find interesting about working in the NHS is on a on a daily on a weekly basis we get really lots of comparable information to see how Sherwood's sure doing compared to others and we know that um, the hospital acquired infection rate 
uh, of COVID at, at Sherwood comparatively is low compared to other organisations. The other point is when there is best practice available, there's easy mechanisms of sharing it. And I think, is it, is it 12 points, I think, for the hospital acquired? There's 12 key points of hospital acquired or reducing uh, the nosocomial infection and, and we're an organisation that's been compliant with them uh, for a long time. So whilst uh, inevitably uh, any form of life uh, has risk involved, there's risk going to the supermarket, there's risk um, walking down the street, etc. Um, we absolutely take um, uh, uh, take our responsibility to provide safe care and to provide uh, a safe location for people to work incredibly seriously in the way that Julie, Tom and David have, uh, have explained. Um, so uh, as Simon was describing, we are open for business. And we wouldn't want anyone who needs to be in hospital to feel that it would be unsafe to come in. That's not to say that with various conditions accessing your pharmacy, your GP, an urgent care centre, NHS 111. For those, for the conditions that we would all identify, uh, they will be more suitable locations. Kinsey, anything you want to finish with? And um, not on the on the topic of the end, um, the, the hospital acquired infection, because I think you're the experts, so you'll answer that. Uh, but I will, you know, as a sort of a, a point of reflection, I think and um, I would say and um, first of all, thank you very much for um, sort of inviting us to these forums. Uh, they, they look quite helpful to me. It's my first time here, so excuse me, my um, not, not not so limited participation, but I think it's an, it's a, you know, it's an indicative of your, of your being inclusive and, and open to, to, to be scrutinised and as questionists. And I know often we send sort of formal questions, although today we didn't. And, and I think what I would say, you know, thanks very much for the partnership. And there's a lot to be, to be optimistic about. I think we had an extremely challenging year, but it has also shown the best in us. And there was so much community spirit and togetherness and everybody stepping up to the blade. And, and I think now the facts on the horizon and hopefully other changes in the coming year. And I think, yeah, I think everybody is, is, is a lot to be optimistic and thankful for. And yeah, thank you very much for, for, for having us on here. My pleasure. Thank you for joining us and, and thank you for your partnership as well. So um, I, I think to conclude, um, we would all recognise the last 12 months have, have, have been difficult, but I think on balance, to pick up on some of the language we were referencing with the with the, the, the question and the answer about um, about the EU exits, there's certain things that we can control and there's things that we can influence. And I think on balance, Sherwood working with partner organisations, uh, whether it's um, NHS organisations or the local authorities or the private sector or the voluntary services, I think in general we've controlled and influenced a huge amount over the last 12 months. Bizarrely, I think from many respects, Sherwood is exiting 2020 in a stronger position than we exited 2019. That's not to say that we recognise COVID has impacted dramatically on our working and all of our personal lives. Uh, but we, we can't change the past, but, I, but I'm, I'm a firm believer that I think the near future uh, will, be, uh, will be more positive than, than some of the situations we've collectively and individually faced over the last 12 months. So um, uh, I think we've got three hospitals in Kings Mill, Newark and Mansfield community that we can all feel very proud of. Uh, and that's because of the wonderful five and a half thousand people who work here, but also because of the, the community support that we receive. So as Simon, uh, Julie, Dave, Robin and Kinsey said, we wish you all uh, a very safe Christmas. It's probably not the Christmas any of us were planning. Um, uh, but, but we hope you can find some form of, uh, of enjoyment uh, over the coming days. Just a final thought, because um, we're spending quite a bit of time at show and thinking about this. I do recognise that Christmas, even in normal years, is a very difficult time uh, for people. And there will be people out in our community who may well be spending it on their own or in, or in family situations that aren't as good as they would want them to be. And, and my personal thoughts are with that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.